Uh, thanks to the Department of French, Francophone, and Italian Studies for your support, and to the Honors College. Uh, thanks also, where is Javier? <clears throat> uh, thanks to Javier uh, Gomez Lavin and to Kate Kenny Newhart for their hard work uh, putting this together. Um, Javier is the, is the president of the Philosophical Society, which is our philosophy club, and they're going to be providing us with delicious treats to eat afterwards. Um, our greatest debt, and the reason we're all here tonight, um, is to Dana Beach and to the South Carolina Coastal Conservation League. And I will tell you that Dana Beach is a passionate human. That is a father <laughs> of the philosopher David Hume, and in fact, being a passionate human is even better than being a passionate human. <laughs>
an MA in History from the University of Vermont, and a PhD in History from the University of Virginia. His articles and books cover a wide range of subjects and issues, and he's published quite a number of books, including Neem at War, uh, Religion, Politics, and Public Opinion, uh, this book won the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Book Award. Cock and Bull Stories, uh, Falco di Baroncelli and the Invention of the Camar, Albert Camus, Elements of a Life, The Philosopher's Quarrel, Rousseau, Hume, and the Limits of Human Understanding, co-authored with the political scientist John Scott. Uh, Bob has also edited several books, in, including Vichy at War, Vichy France, and Historians is co-edited with uh, Sarah Fishman. And Professor Zaretsky has translated two of Zvetan Todorov's books, Voices from the Gulag, Life and Death in Communist Bulgaria, and Todorov's Fragile Happiness, an essay on Rousseau, also co-translated with John Scott. Rob has published many, many articles and book chapters, including meditations on everything and everyone from the timelessness of Thucydides to the so-called Heidegger Affair to an article called Roman Holiday starring George Clooney. I, I must say I'm desperately curious about that one. Rob is currently working on a manuscript entitled Boswell's Enlightenment in the camps of James Boswell's Euro European tour and a novel, a novel about refugee Romanian Jews in France, and the ever-present vampire myth. So, from Neem at War, to bullfighting in the Camar, to the troubled life of Camus, to the relationship between the paranoid Rousseau and the amiable Hume, to Boswell and vampires, not to mention Rob's screenplays, newspaper articles, radio broadcasts, and opinion pieces, Professor Zaretsky is certainly a devoted scholar of the human condition. He just can't resist that time. <laughs> Hume himself was prodigiously interested in everything, and I can't think of anyone better uh, suited to celebrate Hume's life and his legacy. So please give me a very warm welcome to Professor Rob Zaretsky. Statement. 
It speaks about the work of attention. This is the language on the website. The work of attention that our environment and our community demand. And this is the very same language that Albert Camus uses over and over again in his work. It's something that in fact he takes from the work of Simone Weil, somebody he just loved dearly and whose work he brought to the public's attention following her death in 1944. Um, he, aims for this ideal in his work and in his life as well, that attending to others and attending to our world. And in that same mission statement of the CCL is that we need to find, and I quote, a common ground of enlightened interests. This is profound union. It comes straight from David Hume, who devoted his, his life, his writing, to staking out these interests in the company of others. And so, I'm glad to, um, to add my two bits to this. I also noticed on the CCL website that nearly every member spends what seems to me an inordinate amount of time at the beach. <laughs> Everybody on your staff is at the beach. <laughs> I just, um, and I think that Camus um, um, would feel shady. I mean, he loved the beach. Um, as those of you who have read Camus must know, the beach is the setting for so many of his works, perhaps most importantly, The Stranger. But most lyrically, in the case of his last and unfinished work, The First Man. And it's in The First Man that he recalls his childhood in Algiers, when these luminous moments, the happiest moments of his life would be when he would go to the beach with friends. And he called the beach the most gorgeous of this world's offerings. But you didn't invite me to tell you what you already know about this borderlands between sea and land. In fact, you probably don't know why you invited me. The answer, of course, has something to do with Sheridan. Um, and it's not my place to tell you why I think I should have been invited. But since I'm here, let me tell you what I'd like to talk about tonight. And I hope that what I do talk about will justify the invitation. There is nothing obvious about the pairing of the names David Hume and Albert Camus. And I understand perfectly if all of you suspected that the only thing these two men have in common is me. And that's no great shakes. <laughs> But what I want to suggest tonight is that they held certain fundamental values in common, terribly important ones. What I want to do is suggest briefly, as only a non-philosopher can do to what I suspect are mostly non-philosophers in this audience, why these two men have something lasting and important to tell us today. Now I'd like to do it by first mentioning a series of parallels superficial parallels. And then from the series of five parallels, I'd like to move to a couple of deeper parallels, or as deep as a historian can get. So let's first talk about the superficial parallels these two men have in common. All of these parallels share one quality, at least one quality, and it's that of outsiderness, being an outsider. Both men were outsiders. They were strangers. David Hume was a Scot who, for reasons of history, the Act of Union in 1701 and the Jacobite Rebellion, found himself part of Great Britain. He was a Scot who was perhaps the best stylist in English in the 18th century, but yet spoke English in a very thick Scottish burr, and at times was incomprehensible to Englishmen. And he was a Scot in his cultural sensibility. He was not at all English. And this is revealed, for example, in the great Ossian controversy in the mid-1750s. But though he was a member of Great Britain, he was always made to feel the foreigner in England, particularly in London. 
repeatedly in his correspondence with his friends back in Edinburgh, he, he would refer to Londoners as barbarians. And he knew that what they didn't like in him, in London, was his Scottishness. This is also the case for Camus. He was a pied noir, who for reasons of history, the pied noir were those million or so Europeans, mostly from the Mediterranean littoral, who emigrated to Algeria over the course of the 19th century. 19th century. They settled in Algeria at the behest of the French government, where they became French citizens, they learned the French language, and they learned French history, but without ever knowing France, and without France ever truly knowing them. So Camus was a pied noir, and he felt as an outsider to France. He felt as an outsider for reasons of language. Nobody wrote French better in the 20th century than Albert Camus, but he spoke it with a Mediterranean accent. And he was a pied noir for reasons of cultural sensibility, and I don't know where to start um, I'm in a discussion on that subject. He was always made to feel an outsider in France. There's a line in The First Man about his alter ego, Jacques Comfy. And Comfy is reflecting on this sensibility, and he says, what they didn't like in him was the Pied Noir, was the Algerian. Now, not only were they outsiders to their home countries, Great Britain, and France. They were also outsiders amongst their own people. Hume was deeply uncomfortable even in Edinburgh. His skepticism towards all things, particular religion, had made him many enemies. Especially in a Scotland that was still under the influence of a grim Kirk, the Church of Scotland. The Kirk twice tried to excommunicate David Hume. And the Kirk failed, thanks only to the defense marshaled by his friends, people like Adam Ferguson, Hugh Blair, and Adam Smith. By the early 1760s, right before he leaves for Paris, Hume feels like a stranger in a strange land. But that strange land is not London, it's become Edinburgh. And what about Kennedy? Though he loved Algeria, the love was not required. By the late 1950s, many years, several years after Camus had moved to Paris, civil war was tearing Algeria apart. And in that awful, that bloody conflict with France and the Pied Noir community on one side, and Algerian nationalists, the Arabs and the Berbers on the other side, Camus tried to moderate. He famously insisted that the Pied Noir and the Arabs and Berbers were condemned to live together. As it turned out, he was wrong. They were condemned to kill one another. And Camus, reviled by the Pied Noir, scorned by the Arabs, paid a terrible personal price in attempting to find this common ground. A third parallel, they were outsiders to themselves. Let me try to explain this. In his late teens, David Hume had an epiphany of sorts, one in which he glimpsed a whole new scene of thought. These are his words. And intent on heaving the scene into writing, he locked himself away in the family library outside of Edinburgh in order to devote himself to reading and to writing. <coughs> After several weeks, of this regimen, he had, at least from what we can tell, he had for all intents and purposes a mental breakdown, an emotional breakdown. Something happened that plunged him into the deepest of depressions. Jung called it the disease of the learning. Now he eventually recovered, but he remained haunted by this collapse and by the discovery of how fragile our lives are. And 
this experience colors entire sections of his first book, The Treatise of Human Understanding, I mean of human nature. And it propels him to give himself to the one and only life that he had. Camus, when he was in his late teens, one night at his mother's apartment, he began spitting up blood. He was rushed to the hospital and escaped just barely with his life, but with the discovery that he had tuberculosis, which was life-threatening. Now, I believe that the very notion of the absurd is for Camus rooted in this experience, <coughs> tuberculosis. <coughs> the absurd, after all, is the bastard child of disparity. It rises before us when our, it, when our expectations short, fall, short, fall short of reality. It happens when our desire for meaning, our expectation that there is meaning to be had in the world, is not answered by the world. Instead, all we receive from the world is, as one of the most famous lines of the stranger has it, all we receive is the world's tender indifference. The urgency of the opening line of the myth of Sisyphus, there is only one truly serious philosophical problem, and that's suicide. This was written by Camus under a double occupation. The occupation of France during the Second World War and the occupation of Camus' body by the tuberculosis bacillus. Fourth, they were outsiders to philosophy. He was largely self-taught. He did go to the uh, University of Edinburgh. Um, he entered at the age of 12 which was fairly commonplace back then. Um, but he was largely self-taught. He used his library, the libraries of others. And then, after using his, family li his family's library, he then moved to France in the mid-1730s to La Fleche, a small town in the south of France, which also happens to be the town where Descartes did his schooling. And during three years of semi-seclusion in La Fleche, he writes his treatise. Once he returned to Great Britain, Hume, as he tells us in his brief biographical essay um, on my life, he tells us famously that the treatise felt still born from the press. Nobody took notice of it. He tried to get posts at Scottish universities without success. Even his closest friend, Adam Smith, worked behind the scenes to make certain of this. Smith did not want you teaching. <coughs> During his lifetime, in fact, he was celebrated not as a philosopher, but he was celebrated as a historian. He was known in France as the English Tacitus, and he was celebrated as an essayist. I'll say more about essays in a moment. As for Camus, he did a BA in philosophy like me. Okay, he did it at the University of Algiers. Now the University of Algiers is a bit like, is, a, is to the French elite schools, like the École Normale Supérieure, a bit like what the University of Houston, where I teach, is like to a small liberal arts school, like the College of Charleston. It's a very different world. And so he was already outside the loop. Um, based on the school where he studied. Moreover, his professors at the University of Algier, uh, who were Paris trained, um, found his undergraduate thesis on St. Augustine, and Camus, over the course of his life, would always refer to St. Augustine as the other North African. Um, they found his thesis on Augustine and Plotinus to be laughable. They found it a pastiche of just on um, um, bits and pieces that he picked up from, from, from um, ancient sources. His friend, Jean-Paul Sartre, gently mocked Camus' interpretation of Kierkegaard and Heidegger in the myth of Sisyphus. And then along with his followers, Sartre v 
viciously mocked his understanding of modern philosophers in Camus' The Rebel. As far as I can tell, philosophy departments, at least in North America, I don't know if this is the case at the College of Charleston, still mostly ignore Camus as a philosopher. And this is fair enough, I suppose, since Camus never referred to himself as a philosopher. <coughs> but both he and you, of course, did do philosophy. But they did it in a different register and by different means than the way in which we do it today. And this leads me to the fifth and to the final parallel between these two men. Both of them went outside the academy for their audiences. They went to people like you and me. Enterprises or occasions like tonight. And both men moved away from the traditional genres, the traditional forms in which philosophy then was written, be it a treatise, um, be it a tractatus, you name it. Okay? Instead, both men used the essay in order to present their philosophies to the world. Now, in the case of David Hume, he did this because the treatises didn't work. The treatise of human nature fell as it's still born from the press, and that his inquiry concerning human understanding was really no more successful. And by the mid 1750s, Hume is asking himself, What am I doing wrong? And he's persuaded that it's not his ideas that are wrong. His ideas are profoundly important. What he's doing wrong, he decides, is the way in which he is casting. His, his understanding of this new scene of thought. And he reaches out for a different kind of vehicle, literary vehicle, with which to do it. He chooses the essay. He chooses the essay in part because he, is, he was a great admirer of Michel de Montaigne. He was reading Montaigne's essays while he was living in La Flèche and writing the treatise. He was also impressed by the ways in which Addison and Steele, at the beginning of the 18th century in England, used the essay form and their Tatler and their Spectator to reach out to this burgeoning middle class that wanted to be part of the scene. They wanted to talk about ideas. They didn't want to leave it to the academy to do it. And so you pounces on the essay, and it's a great success. And he chooses the essay too, and I think this is underemphasized um, um, by scholars. The myth of Sisyphus and the rebel are not treatises. They are essays. And what I understand by an essay is what the French understand as an essay, to try. It's a trial. It is something provisional. It's a test. You probe. If it doesn't work, you step back and you go in another direction. It is open-ended. I'll say more about this in just a moment. But I do think that the essay not just reflects the natures of our lives, but it also reflects the ideals that David Hume and Albert Camus had of, or had for, a certain kind of society. One imbued with tolerance, a tolerance for ambiguity that was not always found in the worlds in which these two men lived. Now let me move to the deeper parallels I think I see between these two men. A few weeks ago, um, in a class that I teach, the class that I taught, for so many years with Sheridan, it's called The Human Situation. It's a great books course that we do at the University of Houston, the Honors College. Um, I asked my students, there are about 175 in the class, if, and I asked them at the beginning of the semester, we were reading at the beginning of the semester Martin Luther, and then we were turning to Shakespeare, and then to David Hume, of all people. And I asked the students at the start of the semester who had heard of Martin Luther, 
everybody raised their hands. And then I asked who had heard of William Shakespeare, and of course, everybody raised their hands. Um, and then I asked who had heard of you. And it turns out that about the same number had heard of you at the beginning of the semester um, as those who had heard the name Jeremy Lin at the start of the semester. Okay. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Knicks fan, okay? I've been following Lin all along. Um, and, um, you know, now I think my students know you as well as they know the name of Lin uh, because they've read some of his essays in the Great Books course. Um, um, but he isn't known. He isn't known, and when you think about it, it's extremely odd that Hume's name is not as well known as Shakespeare or Luther, because he's no less responsible for what we call modernity than Luther or Shakespeare. Two people, by the way, that Hume did not care for. But there you have it. You have Shakespeare, you have Luther, you have Jeremy Lin, they all belong to the public now. But David Hume has been banished to the Academy. And the fact that the Academy has taken to David Hume is an odd thing as well. And not just for the reasons I've already given. In an essay written many years ago, the English philosopher Stuart Hampshire described what he called the Hume Paradox. Contemporary philosophy places a great premium on argument. Hampshire wrote. A work's value is judged by its formal rigor and the skill it uses in manipulating technical language. Yet you, who's one of the dominating influences in contemporary philosophy, didn't really care about that. Instead, Hampshire writes, Hume's philosophical style was not to prove. Instead, Hume's style was to persuade. The task that he set, that he set himself, Hampshire writes, was to induce men and women to look in the right direction, to lead them back from far-fetched distinctions of the learning to the most obvious, to lead them back to the most general facts of their experience. Now, what are these general facts for David Hume? They are, and this is not in any particular order, they are the sway of our passions, the limits of our reason, the force of our habits, and the rule of our nature. At the end of the day for David Hume, we need to recognize that any effort, be it metaphysical or theological, to establish some sort of transcendental justification for our lives is doomed. It's just not going to happen, he tells us. For you, the ultimate appeal in any argument, whether it's a moral argument or a philosophical argument, a matter of politics or economics, is always the appeal to nature to the regular order of our experience and, as Hampshire says, to the normal course of things. Now the upshot to this skeptical claim made by Hume, namely that we cannot provide any further reason for our most general and refined principles apart from our experience of reality, the upshot of this claim is a kind of philosophical modesty. If we cannot pretend to any knowledge that goes beyond the natural world, and if our reasoning about this world cannot be extended beyond what we experience, we are obliged, you tells us, to recognize that any abstract system of thought or religion that makes absolute claims about the purpose of our lives or the purpose of history. He calls them the severe philosophers in one of his essays. Any such claim, he tells us, is absurd. It's dangerous. 
Not only will it lead to political, religious, or social intolerance, all of which Hume experienced in his life, but it also prevents us from living our lives as best we can, from achieving eudaimonia, a kind of human flourishing. Now, in his essay, The Skeptic, four of his essays are based on four philosophical dispositions. They're the Epicurean, the Stoic, the Platonist, and finally the Skeptic. And in that final essay of this quartet of dispositions, Hume tells us why this is the case. For the Skeptic, the chief triumph of philosophy resides in leading us, and I quote, to those dispositions we should endeavor to attain by constant bent of mind and by repeated habit. The skeptic tells us to forget the heroic stances of the Stoic or of the Platonist. Forget them, the skeptic says. These systems are artificial. They are contrary to human nature. If we can succeed in doing it, it will make us even unhappier, the skeptic tells us. But by our very nature, the skeptic continues, we cannot succeed in being consistently Platonist, or consistently Stoic, or even consistently Epicurean. The problem with these schools of philosophy, the Hellenistic schools, is that instead of helping align our lives with nature, as understood by the skeptic, they try to reshape our lives according to philosophical claims that have no, that have no handle on reality. For David Hume, the empire of philosophy, as he writes, is very limited. Outside the imagination, the philosopher is lost in the man. And, Hume continues, this is how it should be. Were we not lost in ourselves, but instead lost in our imaginations, the result would be the breakdown of the individual, as it was in the case of David Hume, or the breakdown of society. As Hampshire concludes, Herein lies David Hume's, David Hume's most profound insight. He defined a consistent attitude towards man and society, that of the perfect secular mind, a mind which can accept and submit itself to the natural order, the facts of human nature, and do so without anxiety and without a demand for an ultimate solution. Now, once again, what better literary genre to present this notion and this belief in than the essay? The essay, again, is this trial undertaken with the awareness that all of the claims it's going to make, all the knowledge claims that's going to be made in it, in the essay, are provisional. They're not final. Now, I think Hume's decision to use the essay form as a vehicle for the skeptical understanding um, of philosophy and its purposes is the same one taken by Albert Camus in his own essays, The Myth of Sisyphus and the Rebel. Now, Hume wasn't an existentialist, but neither was Albert Camus. He insisted upon this time and time again. And when Hume uses the word absurd, as he does, for example, when he describes the nature of our passions. It doesn't have the same resonance as it does today. But I think Camus, were he alive, to, uh, uh, were he alive today, would say that what we think we understand by existential, the existential notion of the absurd, is not what he understands by it either. That he's been misunderstood. Camus always insisted that the world itself is not absurd. 
The world simply is. It becomes absurd only when we demand meaning of it. Meaning that it's incapable of giving. And it's at this moment, Camus suggests in the myth of Sisyphus, when we think that meaning is to be had and yet it's not there when we expect it. It's at this moment, Camus writes, that the stage set collapses. In other words, the stories, the fictions that religions and philosophies and ideologies have given us, they're shown to be hollow. It's upon this collapse, Camus writes, that the world evades us and becomes itself again. And it's this divorce between each of us and our setting, our natural setting. It's this divorce that is the opening to the feeling of absurdity. Now, you might look askance at the high drama, uh, at the lyricism <coughs> of Camus' depiction of the absurd. But I think you would agree with the good sense behind this heroic sensibility shown by the young Albert Camus in his first essay. The warning that opens the myth of Sisyphus echoes Jung's enlightened skepticism. And I quote, It is essential to consider as a constant point of reference in this essay, namely the myth of Sisyphus, the regular gap between what we fancy we know and what we really know between practical assent and simulated ignorance, which allows us to live with ideas which, if we put them to the test, would upset our entire lives. Camus goes on to write, when a philosopher has once laid hold of a favorite principle, which perhaps accounts for many natural effects, he extends the same principle over the whole of creation and reduces it to every phenomenon, though by the most violent and absurd reasoning. Now, Camus would, in return, agree with David Hume's emphasis on nature as the one source of our morality and our knowledge. In the myth, he writes, of whom and of what, indeed, can I say, I know that. This heart within me I can feel. I judge that it exists. This world I can touch, and I likewise judge that it exists. There ends all my knowledge. The rest is construction. And both men are acutely alive to the potential dangers such constructions represent for human beings. In his essay, The Epicurean, Hume takes to task the severe philosophers who have undertaken the producing of artificial happiness and making us pleased by rules of reason. Now, though Hume is eyeing the ancient schools of philosophy, the Hellenistic schools of philosophy, as well as the 17th century rationalists like Descartes and Leibniz, he could just as easily be scripting Camus' own revolt against the isms of the 20th century, in particular communism. It is not too absurd I, absurd, I hope at least, to suggest that Hume's sustained critique of Christianity closely resembles, in a way rehearses, Camus' sustained critique of communism, of any, ideolo of any ideology that lashes itself, that yokes itself to history with a capital H. Both men were lonely and deeply courageous voices against institutions and ideals 
that held tremendous power in their respective times, and that reflected such isms. Now I want to turn to what I think is the deepest parallel. Both Camus and you understood all too well the dangers of skepticism. We recall young David Hume in the family library, young Albert Camus um, in the hospital ward in Algiers. But both of these men understood that while skepticism can drive us away from others, it can also drive us towards others. Think about the skepticism of Camus the rebel. The rebel necessarily begins in isolation. She's alone. It's when the individual says, I will no longer accept the attacks on myself, on my dignity. It's at that moment that the individual reaches a common ground with other human beings. Think about Sisyphus' realization on that mountainside as he's rolling that rock up, at least in Camus' depiction of the myth. Camus, I'm sorry, not Camus, but Sisyphus overcomes this eternal punishment that has been given to him by the gods by making that task his. He transcends it by embracing it. But of course, Sisyphus is alone with his rock. He isn't in the company of others who are rolling rocks up mountainsides only to watch those rocks roll back down to the base of the mountain. But it can't remain in the stage. And soon after the myth of Sisyphus was published, and it was published in 1942, in the heart of Germany's occupation of France. And it's in 1942, and this includes Albert Camus, there was a growing number of Sisyphuses who realized they were not alone. They were all engaged in that same task of making the situation theirs and of defying the gods, defying those who pretended that they could master their lives, those condemned to rolling the rocks. And it's in the midst of the occupation that Camus understands that the earlier essay was not a success. He had to move on. And he begins sketching out what is to become The Rebel, published in 1952. That the very act of resistance, Camus now understands as he himself joins the resistance, that the very act of rebellion or resistance reveals a common ground of humanity. When you rebel, you understand that you have certain fundamental values in common with others who want to defend them as well. And there's that famous formulation in The Rebel where he takes Descartes' cookie toe and turns it inside out. I revolt, therefore we are. He moves from the singular to the plural. The very act of rebellion implies community, and it implies a community of shared interests as well. But well, where does Hume fit in? Well, at the end of the day, not only is our reason slave to our passions, not only is our reason subjected to nature, but so too is our sociability. Hume tells us that nature carries us back from the precipice. We are unfettered reason. The sorts of reason 
that we saw reified in the 20th century and led to the horrors of the Gulag and the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and Mao's China. That nature pulls us back from this precipice. It carries us back into society. What nature wants us to do, as you write at the end of the section devoted to the understanding in this treatise, after this confrontation with the horrors that total skepticism lead us to, what do I do? I dine. I play backgammon. I converse with my friends. And so both Hume's skepticism and Camus' rebellion ultimately remind us of the necessity of moderation. Excess violence, the spirit and the character not just of revolt, and this is why Camus was, was dead set on making a distinction between revolt and revolution. We can talk more about that after if you want. He was not a fan of revolution, any more so than, than, than you was. And just as excess violates the spirit of the rebel, so too does excess violate the spirit of the skeptic. If you try to become a 24-7 skeptic, life is going to become dangerous, not just for yourself, but for those around you. And any absolute skepticism, as Jung points out, is of course self-refuting. You cannot consistently be that kind of skeptic. In fact, there's one wonderful scene that takes place soon after he arrived in Paris. He was the private ambassador to the British um, embassy uh, that went over in 1763 after the Seven Years' War. And Hume was invited for dinner at the home of uh, the Baron uh, d'Olbach, who was one of the great um, atheists um, of the French Enlightenment. And he's sitting at the table with Holbach and several philosophers, including Denis Diderot. And Hume, in his thick Scottish burr, says to his, to his host and to those at the table that he thinks he, he, he's certain that he never met a true atheist. And Old Bach replied, Mr. Hume, look around you. There are 17 sitting at this table. And Diderot, in a letter to his mistress, Sophie Vallon, said that Hume looked profoundly disturbed by that answer. And I suspect the reason is because you can't be an atheist. He wasn't an atheist. What he was was an agnostic, but the word hadn't yet been coined. To make that kind of truth claim for a moderate skeptic like David Hume simply makes no sense at all. Now, I think this is the reason why both men chose the most prudent, the most provisional, the most conversational of literary genres to suggest their positions concerning moderation and skepticism. Now, I certainly don't believe that being an outsider necessarily leads one to either this kind of writing, the writings of the David Hume or an Albert Camus, and I don't think it necessarily leads to the ways in which they saw the world either. But I do think it helps us explain this otherwise strange dovetailing of concerns between two men who lived uh, more than two centuries apart um, and uh, more than a continent apart as well. Now what do we do with this possibility, these parallels between these two people, these shared concerns? I suppose we could do whatever we would like with it. But what I'd like to do, and here I'll finish, is I would like to make it a topic of conversation. Here among friends tonight, in this room. Um, and if we were to do that, 
to have a conversation about this, I think we would have to imagine not just Albert Camus, but David Yu as happy. We'll finish there. Thank you very much.